Following up with Andy's presentation, which, as he said, was extremely comprehensive and covered quite a, a range of, of, of topics, I'm going to pick up on some of the themes that he was referring to in his talk. One of them was about addressing this question of lock-in. Another is about this notion of opening up and broadening out and thinking of that in terms of the scope of knowledge, of issues, perspectives, values, and understandings. Thinking about this idea of the bush paths and the motorways in relation to pathways. And talk you through this, this idea about a, a helping a whole range of stakeholders, actors, to appreciate pathways to recognize that there are multiple pathways potentially available in the context to which I'll be referring. And then I'm going to walk you through that four-stage approach that Andy uh, described in his talk, thinking about how we engage with actors, how we explore different framings, characterize dynamics, and then reveal different strategies, different political actions for ways forward. And then I'll, I'll talk in that context specifically about one approach that we'll be getting back to this afternoon in our methods talk about multi-criteria mapping <coughs> as part of a suite of methods available to you for, for applying in your research and work certainly that we're doing here at STEPS. And I'm going to do that in the context of the, the, the study that we did in Kenya looking at pathways in and out of maze. So you remember we talked about that the other day, and as part of this, this project, we were trying to look at ways to broaden out and open up a set of alternative innovation pathways, both within the maze system and beyond it, and assess a range of responses from different actors, looking at how they were understanding and, and reacting to, responding to rapid dynamic environmental, social, and technological change in and around the, the maize system, the food system in the country. And when we were talking about maize lock-in, recognize that I was describing this, this challenge in this context where maize security and food security were being treated as one and the same thing. From a policy perspective, from a research perspective, from a livelihoods perspective. Maze is king in that context. And the challenge then is that all investment, all policy support, all technical advice is directed towards generating more maze, of giving people more maze in that system in different ways, which has certain benefits, as we discuss, discussed at the beginning of the week, but also has severe limitations, particularly as change happens more rapidly, climate becomes more uncertain, do people continue to grow maize even in these complex, diverse, risk-prone environments as they move into areas where there's increasing variability of rainfall, greater uncertainty? Is that the best way forward? Or might that be part of a suite of options of possible pathways ahead? So we're recognizing that at the moment the dominant pathway is one of maze driving the entire system. So it's very narrow in the number of inputs available to what we've described as social appraisal and the kind of governance commitment that comes out of that is a, a singular pathway, more maze. And so we looked at how we could move beyond that to understand the discourse around adding another element to that maize system, which is drought-tolerant maize. So it's broadening it out slightly, widening the range of, of, of inputs into the appraisal process and the outputs available, but it's still maize. So our approach was to say, well, how might we use the steps pathways approach to identify, identify some viable alternatives? to widen the array of innovation pathways in the system to consider both maize and other. So broadening the inputs, going through that social appraisal process that I'll describe, and then opening up the array of outputs available to policy and to people in that context. Now, 
Andy introduced this framework, this, this four-step uh, process for appreciating pathways, as he described it. These are overlapping to some extent, and as he described, mutually co-constructing. And we're not saying you need to follow a, a strict set of steps like this. But these can be helpful in getting you, and getting us, certainly, in thinking about how we can take people, policy actors, science actors, local people, through a process to engage with this notion of pathways, to get people to think about how we might broaden out and open up that array of pathways available. So going through a process of engaging with the actors, exploring the frameworks, characterizing the dynamics, and then revealing those strategies, those political options and actions for ways forward. So let me take you through these in the context of the study that we've done on, on maize in that context. First, interviewing the stakeholders, engaging with work on maize research and maize development activities, thinking about policy processes around adaptation to climate change in the food system, thinking about food security and national priorities uh, around that and also from the household perspective. Exploring framings about particular ideas of resilience as I described with that multi-layer view er, early in the uh, week of different views on how you improve resilience in that maize system, in that food system. Thinking about notions of innovation and pathways and then testing those concepts in relation to environmental change in maize in the country. A big part of what we were doing was characterizing the dynamics through a number of phases of carrying out a set of rapid appraisals and doing some, some an analysis of survey data in three different sites of low, medium, and higher potential agroecological zones where people were using maize in different ways in those systems. Of mapping through this analysis that we were doing a number of pathways, dominant, alternative, you could say perhaps suppressed, based on those, those studies, and then bringing those pathways back in our engagement with those actors to work with them to analyze those pathways and have some discussion about what might facilitate or perhaps inhibit access to some of these alternatives in particular particularly in those risk-prone environments where people are growing maize, but where they constantly are facing different forms of different shocks and stresses which limit their, their productivity and where you often get poor returns on those kind of investments. And one of the things we did through that process was to use multi-criteria mapping to start to elicit criteria from the stakeholders themselves, and I'll talk more about that, and then use those criteria to analyze the pathways that emerged through that uh, earlier process. And then finally, actually engaging with a range of decision makers in the science community, in the policy community, as well as local actors themselves, getting people to think about ways forward. Well, how might you operationalize some of these ideas that have emerged through this? How do we open up and reinforce some of those alternative pathways. We had a multidisciplinary team to start with, and our attempt was to, to try to bring together the skill set that was available in new ways, getting people to think beyond the scope of what they were traditionally doing in their disciplines. And it was interesting to see we had a, economists on the team, we had geographers, sociologists, agriculturalists who had a background in, in plant breeding and extension and so on. And it was fascinating to see bringing this team together over the time of doing this to say, I remember one of uh, the economist colleagues just saying, uh, how would we know a pathway when we saw one? What would it look like? <laughs> and that was a challenge to us because we could talk about an, perhaps an infinite number of possible <coughs> pathways. But what were plausible pathways in that context? And what would they look like? How, what would be their attributes? And through a conversation, we started to move from being a multi to, I'd say, a much more interdisciplinary team, starting to think across the disciplines, thinking about how we bring the best of our perspectives together to apply 
uh, those insights in this work. In terms of step one, our, our engaging with the actors, we didn't necessarily do everything, but a lot of those highlighted here in the, in the bold were things that we attempted to get out from reviewing the relevant histories, analyzing the networks, uh, identifying some of the salient interests, prioritizing the most marginal in some settings. Certainly number six, identifying basic pathway visions was fundamental to what we were trying to get at, seeking critical feedback through that process. So we did that by, first of all, doing some review of the history of maize in those locations, in the country as a whole. We looked at that, that, that uh, uh, the priorities that were being set, the policies that were in place around that. We documented some of the, the trends in environmental change. We looked at those questions about resilience I mentioned. We talked about the maize R&D sector and notions of innovation in food and maize uh, uh, production and security in the country. We drew on uh, quite a robust panel data set that already had existed that gave us a sense of change over the better part of 20 years in a number of different contexts to inform our analysis further. And that gave us very good insights on agricultural production, on socioeconomic trends at the household level. And we could disaggregate that by different types of households and by different types of production systems from those lower <coughs> to the higher potential areas. And we then combine that with some of the engagement with communities in those locations where we went out and actually assessed with them some of the dynamics of seasonal change and longer term change, actually tracing back the history of those communities and the agricultural activities, in some cases the better part of a hundred years. So we had that, that sense of change over time. And what were some of the milestones, the moments, where, for example, new varieties of maize were introduced or where important crops that had traditionally been grown there were starting to disappear. Sorghum and millet, for example, traditionally grown in the dryland areas, no longer prominent. What were the factors behind that? We tried to tease that out through that engagement with those local producers in those places. And then we analyzed some of the associated networks. We did that snowball interviewing. Are people familiar with snowball? interviewing the notion of that. It's where you, you interview uh, an informant and you have a conversation about a set of issues. New ideas emerge through that conversation and you, you say, who might know something about that topic? Who should I go see? And they direct you to someone else. And over time, you accumulate new information and insights through a, a fairly a meandering approach, but it, it's guided by the emergence of those new questions that you need to address. And it can open up a lot of insights that you wouldn't otherwise have perhaps uh, uh, been able to gather through a standard protocol if you just went through, we're gonna, at the start, identify these people and that's all, we're, all the people we're talking to. So we went through that, we interviewed people in key scientific organizations, international and national, government ministries, farmers organizations, lots of seed companies, the private sector, it was involved both uh, local seed companies and, and international, range of NGOs, donor community, and others. And then we fed back some of the lessons that we gathered about some of those insights to them to do the cross-checking that was, was necessary. Then we went through this process of trying to prioritize the most marginal through the field studies, looking at Low potential zones, I mentioned a set of villages in eastern province uh, of Kenya, and also looking at poorer households in, in the high potential zone, which is really the maize belt, where maize is king, where everyone has maize on their farm, even the poorest farmers, who probably should be growing something else, but find themselves limited by the system as it exists in that location that lock-in that I talked about earlier, which inhibits their ability to move out of maize into something that might be more viable for them for their, their livelihoods. We carried out, again, more uh, rapid rural appraisal, focus group discussions, key informant interviews, analyzed some of those dynamic drivers of change, the social, the environmental, and, and technological in those systems. 
We disaggregated those communities, so we were able to interview, we did some wealth ranking to identify different types of households and communicate with them to get a sense of their production and marketing strategies in those locations. We organized community uh, events where all that analysis that was done was then presented back and so the walls looked like this. The walls were covered with sheets of paper with their analyses. And they became, they, we invited them up to present back their findings to their community members. And then the discussion happened there with government officials and others listening and us as researchers taking notes, recording that evidence, that information, and in incorporating that in our own analysis. So through that process, we tried to identify some basic pathway visions. The main story we came up with was one of diversification or attempts at diversification for breaking out of that lock-in, for moving beyond maze in all of those different settings. So that led us to start thinking about, because when we went in, our focus was very much on the maze agenda. And we started recognizing that many people were struggling to move beyond maze. So we needed to look at both the pathways in the maze system and beyond it. The question we were asking ourselves though is where is all this leading? Is it towards more resilient livelihoods, more diverse agri-food systems, or are there constraints, serious obstacles, blockages, hindrances to pursuing those alternative pathways? And if so, what are they? And how do we get beyond those? What's it going to take from a policy perspective, from a, a research perspective, from a developmental perspective? So that was stage one. Stage two, we were trying to explore the framings a bit more from those different actor perspectives, eliciting notions of the systems, looking at those different narratives associated with those, thinking about how people value sustainability as they see it in their context, scoping out, this is key, possible pathways that might be options that put on the table for further discussion differentiating among the range of stakeholder perspectives that we identified. So we did this, and I described this in more detail at the beginning of the week, uh, distilled all of those discussions into a set of nine core pathways, particularly emphasizing those drought-prone, risky environments, the more lower potential areas, where the majority of people live, where the majority of the people are still growing maize, even though it doesn't yield particularly well, and where there are all sorts of challenges they face. So we did that analysis looking at people's reliance on internal versus external inputs I mentioned, the reliance on maize as the key staple crop for themselves, and this attempt at diversifying out of maize into what we were calling those, those uh, sibling crops, the, the dryland staple crops like sorghum and millet and cassava, as well as the high, high risk but high return, potentially, horticultural crops like tomatoes and onions, mangoes, citrus. And we map that onto this simple typology, the low versus high maize, the low versus, excuse me, high external input, and we place those in this framework to help us to understand the kinds of, of pathways that might exist, that do exist, and potentially could be strengthened, or which, uh, where others are dominant. With so much of things skewed towards maize, how might we get more of these alternatives? And then we went through a process of differentiating the perspectives because we recognized that this was a starting point for a conversation with a range of different actors, getting them to think about these pathways of bringing these to them and saying, Does this, do these look plausible to you? This is what we think we've heard in our conversations with you as experts, scientists, as policy makers, as farmers, and then getting them to start thinking about, well, what are the criteria they would use for making judgments about the strengths and weaknesses, the good points and the bad points about these. 
and then using that to do some analysis of alternative visions of futures and institutional arrangements that might open up and broaden out the array of pathways available. And we then went through stage three, thinking about some of the challenges and opportunities that would be involved in, in characterizing, analyzing the dynamics around those, thinking about those strengths and weaknesses I mentioned, thinking about different decisions that would be required, different sorts of actions, priorities, investments needed, thinking about the winners and losers in relation. If you choose this pathway, who benefits and who doesn't and why? Starting to attend to issues of power and politics, of who gets to decide. This may be a preferred pathway for a large group of people, but if others are preventing that because of other interests and priorities, how do we address that? How do we deal with some of those issues? And again, seeking feedback through conversations with people along the way. Now, to get at this issue of analyzing the criteria, f or the, the pathways from the point of view of the different stakeholders, we employed this approach, which is on the STEPS website, and which we'll be talking about this afternoon of multi-criteria mapping, which is a decision analysis technique that helps to use the, the, the actor's own criteria for appraising the different options, the different pathways that are available. So it's not us as researchers saying, here, use these criteria to uh, make this assessment. What do you think? What are the criteria that, that you might use? And a lot of times these are implicit. People know these, they talk about, but they don't really expand on, they don't explore them, they don't discuss them in great detail. It requires some degree of conversation of looking at the pathways that are available and thinking about what's good about this, what's not so good, what's the, of, the, of this range of options available to you, which of these is, is your preferred one? What would you reject, uh, say this is not important to you and why? And over time you start to see those criteria surface and then you present those back and you analyze the criteria themselves as part of this process and think about what are the, cr the important, the priority criteria, because they're not going to be equally weighted. So you can do a weighting of the criteria as well as an analysis of the pathways. And that, then you go about analyzing this through a rather structured way. So we develop the set of cri criteria, we evaluate the performance of each of the pathways against each criterion from the point of view of the different stakeholders, and then you weight those, the, the criterion according to its relative importance through a simple sequence of steps like this, using a, a software package in this case, and we did that even with village uh, people in a number of, of settings. And what's important is not only assigning the weighting of the criteria, but reflecting on the outcome with them. Once you've done that analysis, stepping back and saying, well, what does this all mean from your point of view? Do you agree? Does this look approximately right the way you view these things? And then discussing those pathways with a, a wider group of actors. And so we went through a process where we did go through a, a, a an interactive uh, exchange with different stakeholders, mapped out that these are the nine pathways, these are different farmers, uh, farmer groups that, that analyzed them and looked at their, their performance rankings. But what we essentially did was look at groups of informants. So we had 11 stakeholder groups of, of farmers, uh, disaggregated by gender, by income level, as I mentioned, informed by that earlier analysis that we had done. We engaged with a whole range of, of actors in Nairobi, private sector, public sector, uh, civil society, science-based people, clustering them around the senior government officials who have some responsibility for different actions and policies, the commercial uh, sector involved, science and technology, the research community and particularly those who are focusing on biotech. I, ha I haven't had time to go into this, but in the case of Kenya, biosafety and biotechnology is, is a big discussion point. I'll, I'll come back to it at the end. 
but it's one of the few countries now that has a biosafety bio legislation, an act, and a regulatory framework in place. And although GM technology has not been released publicly within the system, there is a move to promote that. And again, the argument is, oh, we're going to come up with GM maize that is going to be water efficient or drought tolerant, shall we say, and that that's going to help fix the food security problem in the country. So there are advocates there who are thinking in those terms. And out of this array of different engagements, interactions, interviews with people, we identified a set of macro and micro issues, sets of criteria around economic and market questions, around stress tolerance related to all those questions of environmental change, and some of the social, political, and cultural issues, and clustered those in different ways to do our analysis using the, the MCM. And then we use that for evaluating the pathways and coming up with our so-called performance ranking of those pathways from the point of view of the different stakeholder groups. So these are literal maps of the pathway scores, and then they're averaged across the different groups of stakeholders and the sets of criteria. These are, we call in MCM, the so-called issues. And then at the far end, you saw the bars there. You, at the far end, you have a range of of optimistic scores, the best case scenario, if you will, and then at the lower end, the pessimistic scores. And that the, the length of the bar, that length of the range, indicates the level of uncertainty and ambiguity associated with that assessment, when the application of that criterion, set of criteria against uh, the pathways. The uncertainty is expressed by individuals, uh, in the, uh, the stakeholder groups and the ambiguity is the result of some disagreement between the groups. So we, we did some qualitative analysis of the, the pathway evaluations and then used that to identify some of the groups of stakeholders with shared points of view. Not all the stakeholders are going to come to common agreement about the best pathways, the ways forward from their point of view, but there, were, there was a surprising amount of overlap between some of the Nairobi-based informants and the rural-based informants who we were interviewing. And we used that to group the criteria according to shared themes, and then we clarified the reasons for points of convergence and divergence within that analysis to understand those performance rankings better. So, for example, we found a surprising amount of good news, of optimism, about the alternative dryland staple crops, those sibling crops as we describe them, where we were looking at sorghum, the potential of sorghum, millet, cassava, uh, pigeon peas, cow peas, a whole range of alternatives that could withstand the changing climatic conditions that were anticipated in these, these risky environments in the first place. And from the view of the, the farmers, from the view of the public sector, for example, there was a, a lot of overlap in the way they understood the, the level of their uh, ability to handle stress in that system. What we found amongst the farmer group is that, yes, they're really interested in maize. There's no question about it. Maize is still crucial to their well-being, their food security but they weren't so interested in these new varieties that were on offer or were being proposed. They were more interested in local varieties. If you remember that little video clip I showed at the beginning of the week, and the woman uh, seed selector farmer, she was saying, we want our maize. And the challenge is, how do you get that maize, but make sure it's of good quality, that it's available when people need it. That led to a whole discussion with the array of, of actors, and actually what was interesting is many of the people in the science community and the policy community said, we know this, we understand this. But they weren't doing anything about it. They weren't investing in improving local maize. They weren't helping farmers to, to increase the quality of that, to increase the availability of that. There were some NGOs who were doing that and were having some success, and farmers were pointing to that saying, see, it can be done. We want more of that. So there was a discussion here, a recognition that farmers preferred 
local maize, not the new maize that was on offer. They wanted to be up here with the, these varieties, not the new ones that were being put on the table. And what we found in, with the Nairobi-based informants is that even, even though they were involved in the whole maize system, and they were, their jobs were pro promoting maize, developing new varieties, getting it out to farmers, getting it out to markets, they recognized that actually it wasn't always the best approach. But they were locked in themselves professionally in the maize system as experts in different ways. And they were saying, well, we know that it shouldn't be just maize, but right now the whole policy environment, the whole research environment, the whole investment environment is stuck in that, that way of working. What we found was that assisted seed, this is this notion I was just describing, this idea of bulking up, making available those local varieties of seed and other, the, the not just maize seed, but the, the, the dryland staple uh, crops and so on, that that assisted seed production and distribution was really welcomed by, by uh, the, the Nairobi people as well as the farmers. But whether you're talking about the, the science technology com uh, community, even the biotech people, the commercially oriented ones, they were all arguing actually helping farmers to get access to seed through those assisted seed initiatives makes a lot of sense and we need to be doing more about that. Now, taking all of that analysis that we've done, we brought all that together and had a whole set of engagements with different actors, the different uh, political actors, science actors, thinking about uh, different forms of agency, different types of interventions that could be pursued within the maize sector and beyond it, thinking again about the winners and losers pursuing those different pathways, thinking about different pol policy responses and science technology responses for supporting or opening up and broadening out the array of pathways. Thinking about, well, who's responsible here? Who's accountable? And how do we make them step up and, and accept that accountability? Part of what we're doing here, and I think a critical part of anything we're doing with this Pathways work, is making, and Andy kind of alluded to it in his talk, the process more transparent, right? You're putting it on the table. People see it, they talk about it, they hear it from different perspectives. You cannot only focus on a singular pathway. There are multiple ways forward. All of them have strengths and weaknesses from the point of view of different actors and their criteria. Some of them have certain winners, some of them have others. That gets laid out. It's made as public as possible. You present that to them, you discuss that with them, you put it in the press, if you can, as an accountability mechanism. And that allows some degree of a dialogue about who takes action here, who, where does the buck stop? And when a decision maker finally makes a choice, perhaps of a way forward since that's her or his job, they can't say they didn't know because of that process of making things more transparent and the hope is making them more responsive, more accountable. Not saying it always will, but it is an attempt through this process of revealing political actions, of engaging with those actors to try to make that make that happen. So you recall we talked about the, the opening up and broadening out at the start, using this pathways approach to foster some kind of critical reflection, dialogue, debate about those pathways, getting people to appreciate a wider set that are available, opening up the outputs, acknowledging that plurality and conditionality that Andy described, and thinking about the governance commitments for ways forward of who does what, who takes action, where does the investment go to appreciate that wider set of pathways. So in this policy engagement part of the work, we organized, I mentioned briefly on Monday, uh, we organized a national workshop that involved a, a lot of those people who were in, involved in the interviews and others, 
We had the farmer representatives from a range of villages there who'd gone through and engaged in the process themselves. We presented the pathways approach and our findings and some of the emerging recommendations that came from the, that analysis. We showed them a video, not the video that you saw a clip of, but in another video which was rough and ready, where we went out and interviewed farmers in their fields, talking about their preferred pathways, thinking about their criteria for making judgments about those pathways, thinking about those questions of, of the kind of lock-in that they were facing and how we break out of that. And we presented that to, as part of this discussion. And then the farmers who were stars in the video were also <laughs> present in the room. And it was a room like this, probably double the number of people we have here. They became the specialists. And as I said to you at the beginning of the week, we kind of stepped out of the picture and the dialogue happened between the policymakers, the scientists, and the farmers. And a conversation was informed then by both the video and the pathways analysis that we had done. And that opened up an opportunity for organizing a set of what we were calling working groups linked to the pathways. And I'll come back to that in a second. And thinking about particular action points for policy the where next, who does what, how do they do it, when do they do it, what sort of resources are required for the different actors. So we organized a set of stakeholder group meetings on the back of this national event with people responsible for uh, climate change and arid lands management and development discussions, people involved in seed policy, R&D around seed, those directly responsible for drought tolerant crops not just drought tolerant maize, but drought tolerant crops and plant breeding associated with the development of new varieties to deal with, with that increasing drought and uncertainty. There was a specific group, the Rockefeller Foundation was setting up a new climate group that was going to be working across all of Africa and we had a, a specific meeting with them as well. And so we fed in the findings to all of those groups and had a discussion about action points appropriate from their areas of responsibility, again, thinking about those issues of transparency and accountability. We then had a follow-up project, STEPS project, and again, I mentioned this earlier in the week about bringing colleagues from the Philippines who'd already gone through a process of thinking about uh, biosafety related to biotechnology and GM in their countries, in their country, and having a conversation with a whole range of actors in Kenya as this biosafety <coughs> bill and act were going through and a conversation of how you deal with the regulation of these new technologies in a, in a con context which is, has limited capacity to regulate such a sophisticated technology. We organized and fed into a set of conferences dealing with different aspects of environmental change in food systems. We produced this video a second video which you saw a little clip of on seeds and sustainability. That focuses pr particularly on pathways in the maize system, the formal and informal, as opposed to the pathways in and out. So there are two videos there. We also worked with the uh, Kenyan Ag Agricultural Research Institute to develop a new program on national climate change in agriculture, which uh, was taking on board some of the thinking that emerged through this project. Since then, uh, a separate initiative called the Future Agricultures Consortium, which is also linked to the group here, uh, had initiated work on the political economy of seed systems, working in Kenya and four other countries, informed by this work. And now we're working with, in eight countries, on a program called Integrated Seed Sector Development, which is looking at that question of formal and informal seed and how you create more plural, more diverse, more robust uh, seed systems in a range of different contexts. So that work is, uh, is happening now. It includes, it, it will be including Kenya, but it's including eight other countries at the moment and it will continue into next year. So that's been informed by some of the work that, that happened through this initial project. That's it.